Hey, today's July 30th, 2015. My name is Randy Watson. With me today is Jim Largent. And Jim, we appreciate your coming in and agreeing to be interviewed and taped today. Happy to do it. And uh, just a little bit of background about yourself. How old are you in years? And Well, amazingly, I'm 75 years old. And uh, I was born in 1940 here in Carlisle. Okay. Lived here most of my life, with the exception of a couple of years that I moved away, uh, particularly when I was working for the railroad. Um, and I spent several years uh, in Wormleysburg, uh, where I was raised from age 7 to 11 when my mother died. And at that time, uh, about within six months to a year, I was brought up to Carlisle to return to Carlisle and live with my grandparents. Um, their name was Bertha and Edward Largent on East High Street. Their address was 823 East High Street, which today is the current address of Sherwin-Williams Paint Store. Right, okay. Where did you live in Wormleysburg? What, in Wormleysburg, I lived at 222 North 2nd Street. And uh, a little history about that address. Uh, my dad bought that when he was working as a block operator on the railroad. It was a shack when he bought it. It was a real shack, and I have pictures of when it was a shack. Mm -hmm. And shortly after we moved there, Ted Horner, who moved properties, came to move buildings for the Harvey Taylor Bridge, where they were going to build it. And while he was in town moving these buildings, my dad approached him about if he would prepare a foundation for this property. Could Ted Horner move the property forward, which set back with 222, and move it forward to be in line with the rest of the houses? So I remember mm -hmm. that project being done. So that house still sits today in Wormleysburg at 222 North 2nd Street, moved from the back up. And since I lived there sometime, someone put a second floor on the property. Huh. So... Is still there, and uh, I have a lot of memories from Wormleysburg. Um, what was Wormleysburg like when you were a kid? Do you remember anything specific? Well, I do. Um, back in those days, we, we all knew everybody from one end of that town to the other, and we roamed from one end of the town to the other, even at a young age, and it was safe. It was safe to do it. The ball field was up at the uh, north end of town, and, and uh, of course, I played some very little... Uh, baseball with the uh, youth league there. I had um, attended the elementary school, which is in the, I guess, 300 block of Wormsburg, the Wormsburg Elementary. And uh, I used to um, I used to uh, well, a, a example, they built the Harvey Taylor Bridge in 1951-52, sometime in that era. And I remember very plainly another lad that I played with and ran around with. We were both young. We would get a wagon and put a big wash tub full of ice and put sodas and some candy bars in it. And we would go out on the dirt that was across the river where they built the, the uh, piers for the bridge. And we sold candy and soda during the day and then at night time this fellow and I would have to go back and gather up the empty bottles and we would get those sodas from a little store that sat in an alley, Freddie Botman's grocery store. And he left us take the stuff out, sell it, and then we had to reimburse him and return the bottles. Uh, as a kid we would go up and down from one end of the town to the other and shovel snow to make some money. We would uh, uh, carry out ashes from people's furnace, mow grass, we had a couple of favorites, Slayton Hills, which was a great memory back in those days, back in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, we would go to Stella Avenue, mm -hmm. and we would sled down Stella Avenue. It was safe back then. It's not like it is today. And then on up closer to where I lived was uh, Elm Street, which come down off the railroad bank, and that was a favorite sledding spot. So all in all, it was a lot of fun. It was it was a good time, and and... At a young age, you were free to run from one end of town to the other, and you never got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, if you did, it wasn't big trouble. Mm -hmm. um, you probably played around the railroad as a kid? Uh, I was told not to, but yeah, I did. <laughs> and I recall one time 
And I'm not sure if I lived in Wormleysburg because for a short spell, I lived in Wormleysburg. And I can't tell you the exact, or I'm sorry, West Fairview. And I, I, it may have been at that time, my dad was a block operator at Old Day Tower, which was at the east end of Enola Yard. And I wanted to go up and visit him in the tower. It's just a little film. And there was a train sitting there blocking between me and the tower. And I crawled under the train and went up in the tower. And the first thing my dad said to me was, how did you get up here? And when I told him, I got a, quite a lecture and told never ever to do that again, crawl under a train. And I remember that. Um, and I remember the steam engines that would pull out when I would visit my dad at Day Tower. I would go with him sometimes to work. And the steam engines would be doubling the trains out to make the trains up and, and the engines would get right outside the tower and underneath the 1115 bridge there. Mm -hmm. And the wheels would slip mm -hmm. and uh, the steam would roar and they'd make a terrible loud noise and scare the heck out of you. <laughs> and uh, basically uh, that's memories uh, of that area. Uh, and back to Wormleysburg, uh, uh, there was a little store right along the old bypass called Danny Nye's Grocery. And that was a popular place I visited every day because he mm -hmm. sold soda and Greenfield donuts and, and he had a, a deal where he sold soft pretzels. Big, big. And every day, the guy that bought them in, one of them was filled with pink dye. Mm -hmm. And when you went in, you picked out a soft pretzel and you tore it apart. If you were lucky, you could see some pink coming through the dough mm -hmm. and you knew which one to pick. But ma basically, you didn't know. And if you got the one with the pink dye in it, you got a big uh, soft pretzel that was your reward for getting that particular pretzel. <laughs> and then on down the street was the Wormlessburg Daily Market. Um, the same fellow that we s sold soft drinks and so forth. Um, we delivered flyers for the Wormlesburg Daily Market. They would take us to Camp Hill and drop us off and mm. so forth. And then going on down through town, and the first church I joined and uh, became a member of the, a young fellow who was a St. Paul's EUB on Front Street. And um, then going down, you had the firehouse where you went to, I think they were called junior firefighters or something. And the nights that we had meetings, you'd go in there and watch black and white TV mm watch Howdy Doody, Cooper Friend and Ollie, things like that. And, and the post office was right across the street at that time. And uh, then on down was the old VFW. Mm -hmm. And all the kids would go and ring the back doorbell. And if you were lucky, somebody come and answer. And they had a, a big tin of, of beer pretzels there. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody wanted to ring the doorbell and get a free pretzel. And so that, that's basically a lot of good memories that I remember from Wormleysburg. Okay. And how about it? And what year did you move to Carlisle then? All right. My mother died in 1952. And uh, we hung around Wormleysburg during that school year. And uh, I even, to finish out my school year, we had just, when she died, I had just started going from the elementary school. The students at, in Wormleysburg were transferred to the West Shore school district, which was Lee Moyne, or mm -hmm. Lee Moyne High School. And I went there to finish out the year, and I recall getting off school, and uh, when we moved with my grandparents, my dad paid tuition for me to continue going to school there while I was living in Carlisle mm -hmm. for the remainder of the school year. And I remember getting the old Greyhound bus and taking the bus from Lee Moyne to Carlisle mm -hmm. to get to my grandparents' house. And, uh, that would have been in, in late 1952 or early 1953, because 1953 I started at the Lamberton Building in Carlisle. Okay. okay. And that's where you graduated from? I graduated from uh, Carlisle Senior High School in 1958. Um, I remember when I was going to the Lamberton Building, I was in the band, and we went over to the field at the end of uh, Orange Street. Okay. And we were there for the groundbreaking ceremony for the new high school. Mm -hmm. So I was there for that. And my first year in the new high school was when it opened in 1956. Okay. So I went 56, 57, 58, and then I graduated in 58 okay. from Carlisle Senior mm -hmm. High School. 
and you went to the work for the railroad after high school, or? Well, actually, no. Um, I had a job for a ring polisher in Harrisburg. Um, I, well, before that, I started and I worked, there was a jewelry store on 36 South Hanover Street in Carlisle called Thomas Jewelry Company. It was actually owned by Claude Robbins, who used to be the mayor of Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And he employed a fella from your town, Portland Springs, by the name of John Miller. He was the manager at Thomas Jewelry Company, and everybody that came in there thought John Miller was uh, Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked there. Of course, my first job in Carlisle was bagging groceries for Dave Javits at the old Carlisle food market. And of course, our history goes back with the Carlisle Food Market because my uncle was, uh, I assume he was in the office manager in the old Carlisle Meat Market for Dave Javits. And my dad worked in the meat department before he went in the railroad. And then of course, they built the Carlisle Food Market on the corner of Hanover mm -hmm. and... Uh, Lather Street? Lather Street, Lather. yes, okay. yes. And I worked there for a year or so. I, uh, uh, while I was still in school, and then I graduated. Then I got the job um, at the jewelry company, and from there I went and I worked just to earn a couple more cents an hour, and you didn't get paid much back in those days. I worked on South Hanover Street at a golf station called Minnick's Golf Service. Okay. The car wash is there today okay. on South Han Hanover Street. And from there, uh, I met the woman that I eventually married, and we realized if we wanted to get married someday, couldn't get married on the kind of money I was making at the gas station. So my dad talked me into applying with the railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad, because he was a block operator. And so I went stumbling into the office in uh, the end of 1959, and I was hired as, actually as a printer operator, uh, which is teletype. You typed up train consists and so forth. And so I worked at the East End and the West End of Enola as a printer operator for four months. And while I continued to be a printer opera, they called me into the office one day and said, we want you down the Cumberland Valley. We need you to become a block operator as well as a printer operator. So in April of 1960, I went down the Cumberland Valley. My first tower that I ever posted at, posting means you learn a job, uh, was Hager Tower in Hagerstown, Maryland. Quite an experience for a 20-year-old and hardly ever out of the area on my own. And I started driving down there, and that was a big experience for me. And that's in the days before the interstate highway. Except. Definitely. Route 11, Route 11 all the way. And uh, I wanted to make note of the fact that back in those days, living in Carlisle on a Friday night in Carlisle was busy mm -hmm. before Interstate 81. People shopped, walked the streets. I worked at the food market on Friday night, and you had police on the street corners directing traffic and all the traffic coming through town. Carlisle was a humming, busy place, and it was a great place to live and grow up. Fantastic. Now, had you moved into an apartment of your own by that point, or a house of your own? Or? Well, uh, when I come on the railroad uh, in 1959, 1960, my wife and I thought, okay, when I knew that I was definitely, you had to go through like a 90-day period to see if you were acceptable. Mm -hmm. And of course, I... I was accepted, and, and so I was permanently hired on the railroad. And so my wife and I rushed our plans to get married early, and of course, being raised by my grandmother, she, she said, Jim, I think you're too young to get married, and she said, I love your Joanne very much, my wife, and, and you, but she said, I think you're too young. Well, she got married young, too, mm -hmm. so she apparently thought she knew. What we, well, anyway, we went ahead and set our date, and we got married February 27, 1960 because I had gotten a job on the railroad, and I felt we we're going to go for it. And it, as it turned out, it, it, uh, it's lasted. So This is 55 years 50, later. Yes, yes, we're so, still together. So, okay. Now, just to help somebody that wouldn't understand, when you say a tower on the railroad, what happened inside a, a tower? What did a tower look like? Well, a tower was basically a two-story building, and it was designed to set up above the track so you could observe passing trains. And as a block operator, you were responsible for 
throwing the switches from inside the tower, either manually with the Armstrong levers or pneumatic switches, uh, and you routed the trains and pulled up signals and kept the trains moving on the instructions of the train dispatcher. I mean, he was your boss, and you accounted to him what he told you to do or not do. You did, and you did it out in the tower. Okay. And you were responsible for either doing it right or if you did it wrong, you got in trouble and, and uh, you got in big trouble back in those days. Okay. So at the tower, the trains would move from one track to another? The, the tower represents an interlocking. And an interlocking is the tracks between the two outer opposing tracks where you converge traffic and reroute them to another track. Okay. And uh, that's why it's called an interlocking. And you naturally route the trains from where they are coming to where you want them to go. And when it's properly lined, you pull the signals up and display it, and, and you keep moving. Mm -hmm. And you either worked, uh, depending on the location, it was either automatic block territory where they zoom by, or like my days on the Cumberland Valley when I worked at Le Moyne, or when I worked uh, Penn Road, which I, I'm not sure whether that actually laid in Cumberland County or Franklin County mm -hmm. because it was close to the line down mm -hmm. there. Uh, that, was, that was main track movements controlled by train order. So we would have to copy 19 orders to run the trains from camp at Camp Hill down to Hagerstown. Okay. And of course the operator's responsibility was properly copy those orders, read it back to the dispatcher to make sure that we copied them exactly the way he dictated it to us. And then we would hand that on to the train along with the form verifying how many orders he should have, whether just a running order, perhaps they had speed orders for certain portions of track, we would hand that on, or a meet order, where you would run trains against each other, uh, and they would meet at a certain point, and one train would have been instructed to take the siding at a meeting point. Okay. So this was all in the day before computers and... Oh, yeah, with, without a doubt. Well, um, we didn't know what computers were as far as railroading. The, the most modern thing that I have memories of back when I came on the river was what we called 261 territory, which is where the trains moved in uh, different directions on the same track uh, because it, it was established by traffic control. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, was, there was no such thing as computers okay. back then. Okay. So the dispatcher was located where? Well, they bounced around a good bit. The, the, the dispatchers were up on the third floor, I believe, of the passenger station in Harrisburg. And uh, they were all located in what we called the movement office. And the dispatchers had little cubby holes about the size of what we're recording in here. And they had a big, long desk, and they had a big, long train sheet. And they had a, a um, little speaker phone there. And all the operators under his jurisdiction would report their trains as they passed the various locations, and the dispatcher sat there and did nothing but, well, he, not that he didn't do other things, but, <laughs> but he recorded all the times that you gave it to them over the wire. Okay. And he marked it on the train sheet, and he, he made the decisions about what trains had priority and, and what you're going to move and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they were in the, the third floor of the Passion Station in Harrisburg. They had moved over the years. They had moved to, to Philadelphia, then back to Harrisburg, then down to uh, uh, Laurel, New Jersey, then back to Harrisburg. So they bounced around over the years under the Pennsylvania and Conrail and okay. so on and so forth. So if a dispatcher wanted to change the route of a train at a remote location, then he depended on the tower and the, the, the operator at the tower to properly route the train. At that time, that's correct. Okay. And then in some areas, the, the signals told the trains when to go and how fast to go, and in other places that was done by paperwork that was handed up to the, the train crew. That's right. I mean, you had uh, 19 orders, which rec uh, reflect some speed restrictions over certain, between mile posts, so and so and so and so. Uh, we would hand speed restrictions on, but if they were in automatic block territory, uh, they either ran under a, a clear signal, an approach signal, or a stop and proceed signal indicating whether the block between them and the next block was clear. Mm -hmm. If there was a train 
in that same block, they would get a stop and proceed, so they wouldn't go ramming up behind the other chain. But if they came into a block, had a clear block, then the next block showed approach, they had to reduce the speed of their train. That was automatic block signal. Okay. On the Cumberland Valley, we'll say, the timetable gave them specific speed re uh, restrictions or, or how fast they could go, like maximum speed. And, and I, I, I honestly can't recall what it was, 40, 45, 50 mile an hour. And of course, the trains would always cheat a little bit. Right. And you could tell when they were cheating when they went by you. Um, there was an engineer by the name of Ralph Hall. R.W. Hall. And he had a reputation as being a fast runner. Of well, he's not the only one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He was quite popular over at Williams Grove, if I remember. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember him, and I've worked with him. I think he used to, when he was on the train, he had some kind of a whistle that he would blow, you know, and nobody knew. Mm -hmm. Supposedly nobody knew, but but everybody did know that he keys radio on the engine, and he blew this whistle, and everybody knew that was Ralph Hall. Okay, okay. So to, back to the tower operators, when you worked around the system, not just on the Cumberland Valley over the years, if I'm not mistaken, you worked at, say, Rockville Tower and Banks and... I worked at Banks, I worked at Rockville, I worked at Day Tower, I worked at Cly, and I worked at Cly doing TMI which was an experience. Okay. And just to clarify, Day Tower is located in West Fairview at the east end of Enola. That's correct, at the east end of Enola Yard. And uh, you could route the trains from there, either down number one or two track to Le Moyne, and then the block operator at Le Moyne would dispose of them, whether they were going down the, uh, going down the York Haven line to Cly on one, one track, or he could go around the west leg of the Y and go down the valley or depending on what it was, if it was engines or something, you could go down to Limo and reverse on the east leg of the Y and go over the Cumberland Valley Bridge to State. Okay. Or Day Tower could uh, route them from Stell, give them a signal down three track to Cly, which is going down the Enola. Right, and right. Cly is located... Cly is, is no, located right east of Goldsboro. Goldsboro, okay. Goldsboro, and uh, you could set at Cly, and you could look across at the towers at TMI. Okay, and you worked there during the... I worked during there. I mean, that, almost all the other employees were told you don't have to go down around Cly, mm -hmm. not the block operators. Mm -hmm. we, we were never told not to report to work. And I think most of us didn't work off the, 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 uh, the, when President Carter came mm -hmm. up to TMI, and it was really bad. Nobody knew how bad it was at that point. But, but uh, I think all of us marked off in the really final height of, of the excitement, we just weren't all sick okay. because nobody would give us, they wouldn't say you can be off or anything. Um, yes, I was there and the operator day tire when he'd give me a train, which that's what block operators do, train leaving day tower, they announce it to you at Cly and the operator up there, uh, a fellow by the name of Smith, would say, aren't you afraid down there? Aren't you worried about this or that? You know, I didn't know any better. So no, I wasn't afraid. I thought it was macho, but when you look back now and read about things and see how bad it really was, it was stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were in the trains regardless, I guess. And uh, yeah, but I don't, uh, yeah, they, they did, they did. But I don't know if the freight was as heavy. They may have not called so many crews. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have just that big, clear of a memory, but I, but they did run some trains during the crisis, yes. Okay. And the, the trains that, for example, went from Day and West Fairview and past Cly and, and Goldsboro, they were going to Baltimore, I guess, or well, Philadelphia? Well, they were going, yeah. Uh, if you went down one track from, from Cly to Columbia, Cola, Cola Tower, was the next block in Interlocking okay. Station. They were going east. They could be going to Baltimore. They could be going down the old ANS branch down the the uh, Port Road to Perryville. Um, and of course, one of the biggest moves that we had at Cly was coal trains for the PPNL plant at York Haven mm -hmm. would come down to us on three tracks from day. Sometimes they'd come down one track. They'd come by the morning, come down if they had a hot eastbound train that they wanted to get around to coal train. They may come to us on one, one or three, and then what the operator would do at Cly was copy an order 
for a train to run the opposing track from Cly to Malpost 67.5, which was right at the switch at PPNL at York Haven. And then we would go out and hand the order on, give them permission, uh, and a block to run the opposing track from Cly to Malpost 67.5. Okay. Now that took place, for those that might watch this and not understand all the complexities of railroading, that number one track was intended to be operated in an eastbound direction, correct? That's correct. Your, your tracks were established. Uh, one track uh, from Le Moyne was east. Two track was west to Le Moyne from Cly. Mm -hmm. Three was eastbound from Day to Cly. And four was from Cly to Day. They, that was a westbound track. Okay. So you had one and two, three and four. One and two between Le Moyne and Cly. And they were established east and west and three and four between Cly and, and Day were east and westbound. So if it was a, an eastbound track and we wanted to run a westbound train, then you would give them a train order to run? The dispatcher would have to put a whole order up at the next tower to hold all eastward trains, we'll say on number three track. And when that was completed, then he'd call Cly and say, copy three for a westbound to run the opposing from Cly to uh, Stell or Day, whichever. Okay. When you say copy three, that's to make three copies. Three copies, one for the operator, one for the engineer, and one for the conductor. Okay, and then those would be handed up to the train crew on a stick, or? Yes, uh, we'd hand them up with a, with a, what we, what the railway buffs like to call hooping up, mm -hmm. hooping up. And, of course, you'd put the orders, you'd put them on a string and put the string around the hoop. train would go by, and you'd hold the hoop up, and they'd just put their arm through and grab the string with the orders, and away they went. Okay. And you would tell them they, they you when you were handing on orders to a train for any reason, whether speed order or whether to run the opposing track, you never were supposed to give them a signal until they understood they were receiving orders and that they were going to run the opposing or that they had a speed order or whatever. You never pulled up for a train. Okay. Now, when you say pull up. You mean the signal, display the signal, operate the control so that the signal would That's tell them correct. they could go. Yes. Okay. okay. So you spent a good part of your career in the Cumberland Valley uh, on towers like Limo at Lemoyne, as I understand, and Penn Road in the Shippensburg area and Hager in Chamber or Hagerstown. I worked uh, my first tower that they sent me to well, when I first started out as a teletype operator. The very first tower they sent me to was Hager Tower in Hagerstown, Maryland. That was a tower that sat right behind South Hagerstown Park in Hagerstown, Maryland. And it was also an interchange point between, right at the interlocking, it was the interchange point to the old N and W Railroad, Norfolk and Western, and also the Western Maryland Railroad, which the yard sat right up from the tower. Mm -hmm. And then on down the secondary track, the operator controlled movements on the uh, Winchester secondary track from Hagerstown to Winchester. And you had uh, the blocks were divided from Hager to Pot, which is at the Potomac River. And at Pot, you had a passing siding. And we would bring an awful lot of coal trains out of Cumbo, West Virginia, bring them up to Pot. And uh, a southbound would win on the siding at Pot so that the northbound could come north. And then the next uh, block limit station was Guard. And at Guard, you would either go straight to Martinsburg, or you went around the curve and into Cumbo, West Virginia, where the coal trains went. Okay. And from Guard, you went to Inwood, which was Inwood, West Virginia. And then from Inwood to Bird, or end of track, which was Win Winchester. Okay. And at Martinsburg, of course, you had the B&O connection, a B&O Y at, at Martinsburg. And we had a yard shifter that worked to come out of Cumbo every day and went into Martinsburg to switch. Okay. And... Did that control any trackage north of Hagerstown, or not from Hager? Uh, I mean, you, 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 you. If you were had a northbound coming out to go to Enola, or Greencastle, or Chambersburg, wherever, he come by Hager, and we gave him the railroad and put him up the secondary or up the runner to town. Um, but then town took over from north of of Hagerstown, and he handed it was secondary track from Hager South, okay. which required written permission and verbal with a signal. You got north of, uh, of town, it was main track, and they needed 19 orders to run from town to wood, which was Chambersburg. Okay. On the main track. 
Okay, and that was controlled by town? That was controlled by town, and he had to call Penrode to get a block from town to wood. Okay, and Penrode was the tower outside of? Penrode was the tower on the old Scotland Road. The foundation's still there, and even to this day, there's a radio transmitter there that I watched them install back in, I'm not sure, the 70s or mm -hmm. something, uh, when they started putting radio communications in. Okay. Good quality stuff. Okay. And then Limo Tower was located in Limoing. Limo was located right at the uh, um, south or the west end of the uh, Cumberland Valley, the old Cumberland Valley Railroad Bridge. And uh, it sat right at the Diamond. A Diamond, of course, is where the tracks cross over east and west and north and south. Mm -hmm. And the tower sat right there at the Diamond. And uh, in the earlier years, it was called J Tower, it was Bridge, Bridgeport Junction. Okay. And of course, then it became Limo Tower. Right. Limo Block and Interlocking Station is a proper way you say it, not tower. It's Limo Block and Interlocking. Right. Okay. And just to, to clarify or add a little bit to the record, that tower was built around 1885 or 1887 and was operated with some modifications until the 1980s, as I recall, and is now preserved at Strasburg Railroad. That's correct. And has been uh, restored, and there's a manual interlocking machine, not from J Tower, but similar to what was at J Tower was installed there. Um, and just, again, to, to kind of clarify, the original railroad through that area was the Cumberland Valley that crossed the Susquehanna, and that bridge is still there. And then later, the Northern Central Railroad came from Baltimore along the river, and portions of that railroad are still there. And that's what you referred to then as Bridgeport Junction, um, that later became J Tower and, yes, and then became yes. known as Lima. And at one time, as I'm told, for whatever reason, the tower was turned on its mm -hmm. foundation. Mm -hmm. um, there's history about that somewhere. I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was done. Maybe, uh, I don't know, but it was changed. Well, it's my understanding that it originally faced the Cumberland Valley Railroad because that was the railroad that, okay, that well, built it. Okay, and then they turned it so that you faced Valley right. Bridge. In the early 1900s, the railroad was expanded. The, the original Northern Central Railroad um, went to York and Baltimore. In the early 1900s, they built the low grade, which are the far tracks that are still in by the river. And because those railroads were busier, that's when the tower was turned, about 1902, oh, okay. 1905. Right. Uh, so there are pictures of the tower turned both ways. And in later years, um, it did face toward Harrisburg, or the operator faced toward Harrisburg. Right. When they were in the Correct. tower. That's correct. Now, if we could talk a little bit about Lemoyne, what did a block operator do in the course of a day? What were they responsible for? I know you have an official definition. and Well, uh, the operator, uh, if you're talking of Lemo Tower mm -hmm. in, in uh, specific, uh, the same thing that I had said earlier, we, we would route anything that came to us, line the tracks up, if it was coming out of Day Tower, you would route it either down the Cumberland Valley or perhaps it would be motors coming out of Enola from the motor pit coming down to reverse the Lemoyne to go over to State to get a train. So you would bring the motors down, drop them east of Limo, and run them around the east leg of the Y and then head them across the Valley Bridge under the wire to get over to State to get whatever train they were after. Likewise, state would often send motors back to you that were going back up to the pit in Enola, so you would just reverse that movement and then go west. And a lot of times they would, uh, when they were making up trains over at state, they would send you an engine with cars to come over and turn at Lemoyne and go back. And when I first qualified at Lemo, I used to dread that move because I never, you'd have to stop and think. Because the, the train director loved to make it difficult. The train director at State loved to make it difficult for it. He'd say, I want the engine turned, but not the cars. Or I want to turn the cars and not the engine. He'd throw at something at you, and you get sucked in and think, now, wait a minute. And then you had to decide whether you're going to run them over the east leg of the Y and back them into the east leg, uh, the bridge Y, and back them into the east leg of the Y. Or bring them straight across and bring them in and then put the cars in on the east leg of the way. In other words, mm -hmm. you had to do it a certain way to get it back to state the way he requested it. And it wasn't always the same. 
Right. And so. It was a challenge to me when I first qualified there. It was funny. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that. And of course, we controlled the local mm -hmm. from Le Moyne. We controlled the local down to Carlisle. And back in those days, they did a lot of switching mm -hmm. in Carlisle. And that's when we had through tracks. You know, the, the freights went through mm -hmm. Carlisle and down the valley. And of course, they came to Carlisle and switched. And uh, they'd have to get permission from the operator at Lemo or Penrose, depending on which way they were, were. If they were working south, they called Lemo, the block section of the rear. If they were working north in Carlisle, they would call Penrose to get permission to come out on the main. And they couldn't come out without proper authority within yard limits in Carlisle. Okay. So we did, we controlled the local switching movements. Of course, trains come out of Enola, like the Yorkies that were going down to Ply, would stop at Marsh Run on number one track down at the Army Depot. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had to know what they were setting in and getting out there, and we'd give that to the train dispatcher. And of course, westbound trains would come to you with large loads of auto racks, which was a big thing back in those days. Uh, and they would set them off at Le Moyne for pickup to go south. They, they'd come west, stop at Le Moyne, and they'd set the cars in the yard at Le Moyne, and then go back to the train and go to Enola. Okay. So there was a lot that went on at Lemo back in the early days of Lemo, and then towards the end there was virtually nothing going on there, so to speak. Okay. Well, let's run through this for a minute. If, if we had a train, for example, when you say a westbound train, that would be a train that came up from the south along the river and would be headed toward Enola and maybe on to Pittsburgh? Mm hmm so they would go by your tower, and then they would uncouple part of the train and have to back them into the yard at Lee Moyne. Set well, those cars off. to the best of my recollection, if they, if they were dropping off cars to go south or auto racks or what have you, they would cut away and pull the, the cars in on the least leg of the Y, and then you would put them on either number one or number two yard track, was, which was on the east side of the main. Okay. So they would pull the cars in on one track and then the engines would come back another track to go back to their train east of Le Moyne. Okay, okay, okay. The person that looks at a map and listens to our conversation will be confused because the east leg is actually in the southwest quadrant, as I recall, of the interlocking at Le Moyne. The east leg is, uh, well, the... the no, the east leg would be the southeast. Okay, that's the part that went toward Harrisburg? The east leg would be the one that would, would come out of the yard and go east around the Y down towards Cly. That's the east leg of the Y. Okay, okay. And uh, the west leg of the Y is the one that come down number one track and went around through the cut of the bottleneck. Okay. And then the bridge Y was out on the bridge came, coming off the valley bridge. Okay, so that was referred to as the bridge Y. Yes, that's the bridge okay. Y. The okay. east, you had the west leg of the Y, the east leg of the Y, and the bridge Y. Okay. So a train could exchange between those tracks fairly readily at Lee Moyne. As long as, yeah, but anything that was motorized, you had to keep under the wire. Right. Right, okay. um, but you could do various things there, yes. Okay, and when we use the term motor, you're referring to an electric locomotive That's motor correct. rather than yes. a steam engine or a diesel. So, yes. Um, okay. Um, and a train that would go down the Cumberland Valley, that would start at, say, Enola and go to Hagerstown, that would go through Lemoyne also? That would go through Lemoyne, and it would go to camp. He may do something at camp. Um, sometimes maybe there might have been a pickup of cars off the running track down there or, or whatnot. And then he would talk to you, the operator, block mm -hmm. operator at Lemoyne, and he'd say, uh, either if he was going to go straight through and no stop, the dispatcher would give you a running order for that train coming out of Enola, and you would have to walk from the tower to the west leg of the Y and hand the order on so that he had it when he went by there. Okay. And then you would pull the signal up at camp, which was a block signal. Okay. And uh, that would give him railroad from camp to spring, which is Newville. Okay. okay. Um, or if he, if the dispatcher had something coming north, uh, you could bring the northbound up to camp, and um, the the southbound or the the eastbound out of day that's going to go south could drop down to camp. Okay. But then at that point, 
you're going to have to get rid of one or the other at camp in right. order for the southbound to go south. Right. But you can run them down to camp without 19 orders. Okay. But from camp south, you needed a running order, a 19 mm -hmm. order. Okay. So the operator had quite a bit to do, really, in terms of keeping track of the Lima at one time was a busy tower. Okay. There was a lot going on. Yes. Okay. And that stopped when they discontinued through trains on the Cumberland Valley, I guess. Oh, um, considerably, yeah. In the 1980s, early 1980s. Down to the point where virtually, in, in its final days or months, virtually all they had an operator out there for, and I guess basically because the union required them to keep, or maybe the, uh, well, anyway, basically all we did was work the local between Des Moines or camp. Mm -hmm. The local come out of camp and went to Carlisle and switched. And he worked down there for quite a few hours, and then he would come back at night. And when he got back up and, and into the yard at Charmanstown, the operator virtually had nothing else to do in the final days of Lima because mm -hmm. there wasn't any. The tracks were being torn out, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no trains going down one or two to Cly. So there was mm -hmm. just not much to do. So as the, the towers closed, were you able to continue working on the railroad, or, or what happened? Well, I had gone in and worked in the division office some. I was went in to work as an assistant wire chief, which helped to assign the men, uh, and, and we handled the, the assignment of the men from uh, the Harrisburg area and, and even down in Washington, D.C., like Anacostia and uh, Virginia Tower. We were in charge of the operators that were still working in Reading. Um, at Oley Tower and the other one. Uh, was Spring still open then? Spring, well, Spring, uh, Spring was, I got to think about that a little mm -hmm. bit. The, we had two towers. One was, uh, was uh, Oley, and I'm trying to think what the other one, I don't think it was Spring. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I can't recall. That's okay. Point. That's okay. Um, so you oversaw. But we 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 assigned those men as assistant wire chief and wire chief, and then eventually, somehow, uh, I was able to uh, be appointed. I, you had to bid it, but you were selected. You put a bid in for the job of wire chief, okay. which was who I accounted to when I come on the railway when I was nineteen years old, twenty years old. I eventually got that position. Um, I was appointed by, uh, selected and appointed by Abe, Abram Burnett, mm -hmm. and I worked out for a short while, and then eventually I wound up getting laid off. The job was pretty much cut off my position, and I worked um, temporary block, which is when the towers are going, they would send us, and that's basically what block operators mm -hmm. did towards the end, okay. was go out along the track and work at hand-operated switches on the Harrisburg Division. You could call it temporary block or you could call it emergency block. And they ordered us out there at all kinds of weather, hot heat in the summer, cold, freezing ice and snow in the winter. And we routed trains when they took tracks out of service we would throw the hand switches and instruct the trains that they were going to cross over and we would give them mm -hmm. running orders. Uh, in the early days, they ran by 19 order, but then that was dropped and then it eventually it came down to form Ds, which gave a person to run uh, the opposing track. And of course, the operator would line up the switches, give them hand signals and uh, instructions over the radio and away they went and then we would reline the switches and so forth. But that was what I'd done in the remaining years on my on the railway career. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's all pretty much computerized and controlled by a single person. And well, you know what? I've been off for thirteen and a half years, and I my qualifications long ran out. And mm -hmm. I honestly, my qualifications would be done. I mean, right. I, I just wouldn't know. Right, it changes uh, that that rapidly. It, it's probably been quite radical. Yeah. You obviously enjoyed your career on the railroad? Oh, yeah. I had some trying moments, and I had some rough times, and I did an awful, awful lot of traveling. I uh, Very rarely did I work close to home. It was nothing to work Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, 
Christmas Day, uh, in the earlier years, nothing shut down. Mm -hmm. In later years, the railroad started to, I don't know what the expression would be, wise up or change their ways or whatnot, but they started shutting down trade movements over the holidays for two days. Mm -hmm. And they would shut the tower down with the understanding that if an emergency come up or they needed you, they'd be able to get a hold of you and get you out. Mm -hmm. If they did that, of course, you got a day's wages just to set it home. But if they needed you, uh, they called you and you were expected to be available to come out and cover your job, in which time then you'd get holiday pay. Mm -hmm. But it was nothing in the early days to work every day of the year, holidays, and mm -hmm. no matter what. Yeah, the railroad's a 24-7 environment. Without a doubt, yes. Not a terribly humane employer, from what I understand. Uh, you said that, yes. <laughs> That's true, yes. Is there anything, Jim, that sticks out in your mind as a, um, the most interesting day you had in a tower? Oh, there's quite a few that I can't... I can't uh, anytime you went out and experienced a derailment, a bad derailment, mm -hmm. It was a hectic day, and it was one that you would never forget. And my biggest experience was the night I was working at Ply down at York Haven, east of York Haven, and a train called the Double E-2 with motors derailed in the interlocking. And there I am sitting in the tower, and of course the interlocking sits right out in front of you, and he's going by there at normal speed from 3 to 1 to go east of Columbia. And... All heck broke loose. It lit up like a Christmas tree in the interlocking. I mean, uh, the train derailed. Quite a number of cars derailed. Uh, um, the catenary system come down. The fire flew, so on and so forth. And uh, it was it was a hectic experience. But I mean, I've had derailments other places, but that was without a doubt the worst. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cars could have come in the tower, but they didn't. They stayed out away. And eventually, Day Tower was destroyed when a train derailed. Day Tower was destroyed uh, on my day off. I worked metal trick at Day Tower when that happened, but I happened to be off, and the operator on duty, uh, and I talked to him, and, and he described it. It was a nightmare because he had a climb with, covered with dust out over the debris. He was very fortunate to be alive, and he was saved by a catenary pole that sat right at the west side of Day Tower. The operator's name was J.R. Sacrapon, and he was on duty when it happened. And uh, amazingly, uh, nobody seemed to be concerned about his welfare when, when he climbed out of the tower and went off to the side. And, and uh, the bosses come out, and it's my understanding from him and, and others that talked to him that nobody seemed to really be concerned about his safety or welfare, mm -hmm. which, you know, is strange. Right, right. Okay. Anything you remember is like the funniest day or the funniest thing that ever happened? Were there ever funny things that happened? In oh, the there was always funny things that happened. <laughs> Some you might not want to talk about. Or, <laughs> um, well, only one comes to mind funny, and there's been a lot of funny things. Some I wouldn't want to tell you about, but I remember working at Town Tire, which was north at the north end of Hagerstown, Maryland, and... Uh, we had a coal train go up on town siding, which was north of town, and wait for a southbound train. And of course, the coal trains that come out of Cumbo had helper engines on the rear end of the train. Well, at this point, it's been quite a while ago, I don't remember how the train became parted. I just don't recall how that happened. Some were 50 cars or so deep and for whatever reason, it was a misunderstanding of communications. And the, and the head end, I had given them the block mm. to go. But the train wasn't coupled in the middle. And the train took off going north with, well, let's say half the train. And supposedly unknown to him that the rear end was still sitting back on, mm -hmm. on town siding. And uh, the dispatcher thought real quick and we called an operator that lived in Greencastle to run out and fly him down. Because back in those days, the radio system was not good. Mm -hmm. When I first went to work down the valley in 1960, radio communications were, if you could talk the train a mile or two out, that was something. Mm -hmm. you, you couldn't talk long distances like you can today. And uh, so I, for whatever reason, I couldn't communicate to that train at town, but he was, he was taken off with 
only half of his train, and, and of course the air hose was closed so that the air come up and away he went. Okay. Yeah. And the rear end train with the helpers was sitting back on the siding. But I mean, there was a lot of funny things, and I, mm -hmm. if I thought long enough, I could tell you some more. But right. I'm sure there were some characters worked on the railroad. There were some characters. There was some characters. Maybe they considered me a character. I don't know, but there was some characters, and there was guys in train and engine service that did things back then that you'd never do on today's railroad and get away with it. I mean, they got away with some, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd rather not say mm -hmm. on a recording, but, uh, you know, like they, they had cabin cars, and once they called on that cabin car, we'll say in Hagerstown, and we're going to Enola, they, they'd fix the fire in the, in, the, in the stove in the cabin car if it was cold weather and whatnot, or they'd put the coffee on, or their, they'd prepare a meal while they were in the cabin car, and then they'd go up in the, crow's nest and fall asleep and many a time as an operator at Penn Road uh, you'd go out the hand onto the cabin car nobody was out mm -hmm. and you can assume what they were doing right there was characters yeah and they got away with it I guess it worked but they yeah they, they got away I mean back then you didn't report them for that kind of, you just because if you did you wouldn't get along with the fellows you just right. you just couldn't report that kind of stuff right Anything else you remember that you'd like to, to talk about before we wrap up? It was um, railroading or or anything in general. Um, anything in general. Um, well, we covered a lot of ground fairly quickly here. Okay. Um, I uh, like to relate to Carlisle when I came here to live. Uh, I was born here and lived here most of my years and to me for anyone that, that uh, takes an interest in this video back in the day when I was a young kid Carlisle was a great town to live in it was a quiet town it was it was a, a good hometown place and uh, it was just an enjoyable life and I dare say in my mind it isn't the same today as it was back in the 50s and 60s uh, crime wasn't like it is today and you could roam the streets at night and go uptown and have a good time and, and as teenagers we went out when we got our license we could drive around and we listened to the old old radio stations, mm -hmm. the oldie songs and, and you didn't get in trouble mm -hmm. and nobody did a drive-by shooting or anything it, it was just a quiet, pleasant clean town mm -hmm. I think that's changed mm -hmm. Um, I have memories of the market. I have memories of the mansion at Albion Point. Uh, riding my bicycle home from school and, and passing that point every day. And, and where the plaza sets today, the Plaza Mall, that was uh, the mansion and uh, beautiful pine trees in there. And then on out across from where Sherman Williams is today, or Sherman Williams, uh, where I was raised, that was cornfield across mm, okay. Jungle Road. It was a big cornfield. And it was actually country out there then. Mm -hmm. But not today. No, it's grown up everywhere. Uh, yes. And of course, I have memories of going out to Holly Pipe to the, uh, um, the barbecue. Uh, what was it called? The, was that Zizzy's? Zizzy's, Zizzy's, yeah. And then it was also a place, I think it was called the Yellow Canary, that sat on the old point mm -hmm. of uh, the Boiling Springs Road where you bear off went to Boiling Springs before they changed that okay. intersection. There was They moved it. They moved it from there over to the Trindle Road. Now it's a used car lot there today. Mm -hmm. okay. But it was, a, it was a place where kids went for milkshakes and hamburgers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when I was young, I spent many a memorable day out in Boiling Springs. My aunt and uncle had the big house on the curb out there in Boiling Springs, and I would go out there and spend my summers out there with my cousins, and we spent time at the Boiling Springs pool, swimming up till mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night, and they played music on the jukebox and had a little dance floor there. And it was a great time, mm -hmm. a great time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, again, we thank you for your time. and It was a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you.